Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. After a unanimous vote by CDC advisors, will kids now have to get the COVID-19 vaccine to attend school? NTD hears from two experts to find out more. And as midterms are approaching, a Republican election official in Arizona is under scrutiny for using his official position to post his political views. President Biden is in Pennsylvania touting infrastructure investments and raising money for Senate candidate John Fetterman. How the president reacts when asked about the lack of Democrats willing to campaign with him. In the UK, Brit Brit Prime Minister Liz Truss resigns after 44 days in office. What an economist says could pull Britain and other Western nations out of economic crisis. And 12 drag performances at a cultural center in Ecuador. The U.S. State Department is funding them with taxpayer money. In a unanimous vote, CDC advisors recommended adding COVID-19 vaccines to the immunization schedule for children. Now it's up to each state to decide if they'll mandate it for school. NTD's Jason Perry has that story. Before their unanimous vote, the CDC stressed that their recommendations are not requirements. But currently, 31 states have laws that mandate the CDC's immunization schedule for children to go to school. That's according to the Policy Practice and Prevention Research Center at the University of Illinois Chicago School of Public Health. And now, CDC advisors recommend adding COVID-19 vaccines to the schedule. A specific timeline has not been officially adopted by the CDC yet. Dr. Peter McCullough shared his thoughts on NTD News. You know, I see patients with COVID-19 in my practice over the course of the last three years, including uh, giving advice on younger children. The disease is characteristically mild, is easily treated, and so the vaccines are not medically necessary. Uh, they're not clinically indicated, and we don't have any assurances that these are going to be safe over the short or even longer term. I, as a cardiologist, I have great concerns over myocarditis. A paper by Mansugin and colleagues from Thailand, the first prospective cohort study, showed a rate of 2.3 percent of damage occurring to the hearts in children ages 13 to 18 who took the COVID-19 vaccine, and that's just with one shot. So I'm greatly concerned uh, that this decision is off the rails. Uh, these uh, vaccines are still experimental, and they shouldn't be brought into the vaccine schedule. McCullough warned that this could erode parents' trust in the vaccine schedule. I spoke with Wayne Rohde, a top expert in the laws and politics of vaccine compensation. He explained how this could play out. I know California and New York are probably happily waiting for it to happen as far as uh, health commissioners. Other states like Florida is going to push back on this. Texas will probably push back on this. Tennessee would push back on this. Um, and unfortunately, it's going to be kind of a red versus blue state um, argument again. Um, but the parents can decide they need to get organized and watch how the process has to lay out in that state. A lot of it's going to be a administrative rulemaking, but then you can force the uh, health commissioner at that time to have an open hearing about it and allow public testimony to decide. And then an administrative rule a judge would then rule whether or not to accept it or not. We reached out to the CDC for comment, and we're still waiting for a response. Jason Perry, NCD News. In Arizona, a Republican election official is accused of using a public website to promote his political views. And his views aren't what you might expect. NTD's Arlene Richards reports. In a few weeks, Arizona voters will decide on a ballot measure called Prop 309. If passed, it would require voters to write their birth date, identification number, and signature on mail-in ballots. Republicans in many states support stricter voting requirements, especially in states where voting integrity has been strongly questioned. In the 2020 presidential election, Arizona's largest county, Maricopa, came under scrutiny for alleged election fraud. The Republican election recorder, Stephen Richard, didn't support the view that the election was stolen and he doesn't support a stricter voter ID law either. 
A political committee that supports Prop 309 filed a complaint with the state attorney general about Richer. They accuse him of posting a political message on the county website that tells people how to vote. What Mr. Richer did was he went and and he did this letter that was purportedly on behalf of every single county recorder in the state. Arizona has 15 counties. The letter is not unanimously supported by all 15 county recorders. The so committee's attorney, recorders. Timothy Lasota, said Richard's campaign hinged on criticizing Democrats. Mr. Richard, he ran for office, um, essentially, uh, you know, he was very critical of the former county recorder, who was a very liberal Democrat, uh, Adrian Fontes. Lasota said during his campaign, Richard submitted a 200-page report that questioned Fontes' integrity. It was similar to other reports from Republicans concerned about election integrity. But ever since he's gotten into office, he's sort of gone native and he's abandoned the Republican principles that got him elected. Richard has taken down the political message against the bill and said it was a minor issue. NTD reached out to Richard to get his response to Lasota's comment that he abandoned Republican principles. We haven't heard back yet. But Lasota says what Richard did isn't so minor. There's nothing minor about using taxpayer money to uh, support a particular political agenda. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. Mr. Richard just now responded via email to NTD. He said he's been a Republican for a long time and said, quote, I have consistently said that the 2020 election wasn't stolen. I have opposed those who lie about the 2020 election. Continuing, quote, I don't think that's a Republican or Democrat thing. It's simply fact versus fiction. And turning to Pennsylvania, President Biden visited the battleground state today. NTD's Iris Dow has more on that. For too long, we talked about building the best economy in the world and the best infrastructure in the world. Now we didn't do it. We we're finally getting to it. We're getting President Biden is in Pennsylvania today touting infrastructure investments. He's back in front of the Pittsburgh's bridge, which collapsed right before his visit in January. He uses the bridge as a symbol of what he calls his legislative achievements. The result, Pennsylvania has been able to repair Fern Hollow Bridge in less than a year. And by Christmas, God willing, we'll be walking. I'm coming back to walk over to sucker. Biden signed the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill last November while touting it as a historic effort to tackle climate change. And that's exactly what some Republicans weren't happy about. They called it money for Democrats' Green New Deal. Biden today took aim at those Republicans who voted no. But a whole lot more voted against it. Now they're quietly and privately sending me letters. <laughs> Not a joke. My administration asked for money. But Biden's not just there to tout infrastructure money. He's joining a fundraiser event with Democratic Senate candidate John Fetterman, who's now facing scrutiny over his health after he had a stroke just months ago. While the White House said Fetterman was present, he did not speak alongside Biden on stage. Meanwhile, given Biden's low approval ratings, some Democrats in swing states have been reluctant to appear with him at public campaign events. Here's Biden getting questioned on that before leaving for Pennsylvania. John Fetterman's going to appear with you today yeah. in Pennsylvania, but there haven't been that many candidates campaigning with you. Why That's are more not true. There have been 15. Count. Good count. Okay. And Biden has increasingly sought to highlight his connections with the battleground state of Pennsylvania. Thursday's trip is his 14th to the state since taking office, and his 15th trip is already scheduled for next week. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. With just 18 days until the midterm elections, candidates and election officials are making some interesting headlines. And we have our Arlene Richards to take us through it. In Arizona, Secretary of State Katie Hobbs said her office sent out some erroneous ballots. She explained in a statement on Tuesday that a fraction of a percent of voters were registered as federal-only voters when they should have received a full ballot. Hobbs, who was also the Democratic gubernatorial candidate, clarified in a tweet Wednesday that the error could affect up to 6,000 voters. But she said it doesn't mean all of them received the wrong ballot. She adds that voters who received the wrong one will soon be sent a new one. And over at the White House, Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre declined to comment on a statement from Georgia governor candidate Stacey Abrams. Abrams, who's endorsed by President Biden, said abortion could help mitigate the cost of inflation. A reporter asked Jean-Pierre if Biden agreed. 
Uh, I did not see her comments on this, so I don't know the context of this. Again, I want to be careful because this is a political debate, uh, and it, it's related to a midterm and election. Uh, so I, this is, I'm not going to comment on that. Abrams' opponent, incumbent Governor Brian Kemp, accused Abrams of wanting abortion without limits to fix inflation. In Pennsylvania, Democratic Senate nominee John Fetterman has gotten the go-ahead from his doctor to resume business as usual. After having a stroke back in May, he released a medical report Wednesday with a note from a doctor saying he's recovering well and has no work restrictions. But two weeks ago, NBC reporter Dasha Burns interviewed Fetterman and later commented that he had difficulty understanding their conversation off camera. Fetterman uses closed captioning to understand speech, and his doctor says he still has some hearing difficulty, but his speech is normal. And Florida is preparing for the November midterms. Election officials in Miami-Dade County held a public event to test their voting machines on Wednesday. They say they do this test on every voting unit prior to every election. Our job is to make sure that elections are run honestly in Miami-Dade County. And we think that Christina White and her staff have been doing a great job in running honest elections. But as President Reagan said, trust but verify. So we're here to verify. Both Democratic and Republican observers attended the process. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. And after just weeks in the top job, Liz Truss announced she will resign as Britain's prime minister. It comes a day after she insisted she's a fighter, not a quitter. Here's Truss earlier today. I recognize, though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. Her announcement comes after a series of politically devastating U-turns on economic policies. In the tumultuous few weeks leading up to this point, growing numbers of British lawmakers had called on trust to reconsider her role as Prime Minister. And earlier today, I spoke with Daniel Lacaille, Chief Economist at Tress's Hedge Fund, for his perspective. Daniel Lacaille, welcome to our show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Now, in your view, to start with, what caused the UK's market turmoil? Well, to start with, the market turmoil was caused by what is uh, happening all over the world. It's happening in Japan. We're seeing how the yen has reached a 32-year low. We've seen uh, how pension funds had to find uh, new levels of collateral for higher margin calls. Margin calls are rising all over the world for extreme levels of debt. So what, it's basically the vacuum effect of the U.S. dollar on the global economy as rates rise. What happens is that the, uh, it all coincided with the presentation of a mini budget by the prime minister of the U.K., the ex-prime minister, Ms. Liz Truss, which was a very misguided mini budget, but not the cause of the U.K. turmoil. What's your take on Liz Truss's economic policy overall? I think it was very misguided. I think it was the typical uh, idea that if you present a budget in which you massively increase spending, but you also add a few tax cuts, uh, everybody will be happy. No, So uh, the people that are suffering from high taxation will be happy and the people that uh, uh, want more spending will be happy as well. But it's, it's something that doesn't work, obviously. You cannot present a budget in which you're not looking for a way to fund those policies. What's next for the UK's economy, do you think? Well, I'm very, I'm very worried, to be fairly honest, because in the UK, um, the narrative has uh, fallen to the idea that the reason why the uh, uh, prime minister has had to resign was because of the tax cuts. So it seems like the problem is the tax cuts, yet the deficit increase came 65% from government spending increases. No? Um, so I'm afraid that Labour is going to present a budget that is a budget proposal that is going to be more spending and more taxes, 
And that the Conservative Party is also going to present a budget with more spending, but no tax uh, cuts. No. So ultimately, the problem of the UK is that the promise that was presented when Brexit was announced, that the UK would become uh, yeah, an, a, a pool of attraction of capital from the world, uh, an environment that would be very positive for business, that would have low taxation and low levels of regulation as opposed to the European Union, is actually going the opposite way. So what do you think should be done for the UK and for the rest of the Western world going forward? Well, what should be done is not going to be implemented, so I'm going to say it anyway. If you have a supply problem, you have to implement supply-side policies. So what the world needs is to think less about central banks printing and lowering rates, thinking less about governments spending, 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 spending as if there was no limit to the budget. And the world needs to start looking at supporting the real economy, which is the fabric of society, small businesses, uh, corporations, families, etc. And so just in a practical sense, what would that solution look like? Well, what we need to do, we certainly need to cut taxes. Absolutely, do, we do, because the taxation in developed nations is extremely elevated and is reducing potential growth and employment. But also, we need to cut unnecessary spending. Governments like the United States government or the UK government have not only not reduced expenditure after 2020 and the COVID pandemic, but they continue to consolidate and increase spending. All right. Daniel Lacaye, Chief Economist at Tresses Hedge Fund, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. And President Biden today reacted to Truss's resignation. He said he was not worried that the UK's economic spillover would affect the US. And California. Parents and teachers have been demanding both answers and a police investigation into a controversial LGBT advocacy group that's being promoted in public schools. NTD's Daniel Hall spoke with a parent who spearheaded her own investigation. Earlier this month, a group of community leaders called for an investigation into an LGBT support group called the Trevor Project. Celeste Feeler, a parent in Southern California's Coachella Valley and member of Riverside County's Moms for Liberty chapter, told NDD about her research and personal findings when looking into the promoted website. It was an LGBTQ uh, youth suicide prevention for 13 to 24 year olds. I thought, that's a red flag, 13 to 24 year olds. What do they have in common that they uh, could be talking about, um, you know, sex? The Trevor Project is an organization that provides confidential crisis support services to LGBT youth via text, chat, or calls. Multiple school districts promote the site, and that's how Feeler found out about it. So I, I looked even deeper into it, and I started seeing that there was adults asking uh, children to leave the site and go on their Discord. Feeler says her findings are consistent with predators in chat rooms with minors and can open the door to grooming, exploitation, and child trafficking. This is a, you know, pedophilia. Um, it, there's nothing else to call it. Feeler filed a complaint with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department last July and was referred to the Riverside County Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force. They did their investigation, uh, as they claimed, and they found that nothing of the sort that I was finding and every other parent was finding was actually in that website. Riverside County Sheriff Chad Bianco told the Epic Times that schools promoting such services for 13-year-olds is, quote, morally reprehensible. He said, it's no different than our schools teaching sex ed to a kindergartner. It is absolutely ridiculous, but it's not criminal. Bianco said, if parents are unhappy about school's direction, the blame should fall on lawmakers and school board members, not law enforcement. Feeler agrees. We have to take control of this situation. These people are coming after our children. Uh, we need 
to stop this. We are the force. They don't have a voice. They don't understand. They can't comprehend this stuff. They can't defend themselves. And it is our job to do so. The Trevor Project has not responded to requests for comment, but the organization says that its purpose is to help struggling LGBT youth and provide counseling. Daniel Hall, NTD News, California. And the U.S. State Department is funding drag performances in the South American country of Ecuador. This is according to the department's online grant summary, as first reported by Fox News. The State Department grant went to an Ecuadorian nonprofit and totaled over $20,000. The department said the purpose of the grant is to, quote, promote diversity and inclusion. The Cultural Center will be using that money to host three workshops and 12 drag theater performances and to produce a two-minute documentary. Their project runs from the end of September through the end of next August. The grant is part of the State Department's public diplomacy program. And the Cultural Center is supported by the U.S. Embassy and Consulate in Ecuador. The center has been getting money from the State Department for years, but this appears to be the first time it's using that money for drag shows. And up next, alleged censorship by Brazil's highest electoral court. The court reportedly prohibited the nation's largest conservative media outlet from stating some facts about the left-leaning presidential candidate. And in sports news, NBA All-Star Kevin Durant has joined a new league that includes fellow stars LeBron James and Draymond Green, as well as Tom Brady. That and more coming up. Attention Camp Lejeune employees. If you were a contractor or non-military employee who worked at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina prior to 1988 and developed any of these cancers or suffered any of these injuries, you may be eligible for significant financial compensation. Leaking underground tanks contaminated the drinking water with benzene and other highly carcinogenic chemicals. Call Camp Lejeune victims to discuss your case now. If you don't win, you pay nothing. 800-245-2189. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. A federal court in Brazil allegedly banned a major TV and radio network from saying certain things about the country's left-leaning presidential candidate. The media outlet in question is the nation's largest conservative station. Chauvin Pan is a Brazilian media outlet with a TV station and reportedly the largest radio network in the entire southern hemisphere. It's also the largest conservative-leaning outlet in the country. On Wednesday, the media outlet reported that Brazil's superior electoral court ruled that the station is no longer allowed to say certain things about left-leaning presidential candidate Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva the former Brazilian president who was convicted of corruption and spent almost two years behind bars. Terms the outlet allegedly can't say anymore include former inmate, ex-convict, thief, corrupt and ringleader. NTD spoke with Rodrigo Constantino, a Brazilian economist and political commentator living in Florida. He says the alleged court ruling doesn't make any sense. It's, it's absurd. It's history. He was. He was arrested. He was convicted. He was guilty. And uh, we cannot uh, say that Lula uh, is what he is. So it's, it's censorship. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro and supporters often criticize the electoral courts for allegedly being biased and trying to rig the election. Constantino says Bolsonaro is, for example, not allowed to use speeches he gave during his presidency for his current campaign because the courts ruled it would be unfair and an abuse of power. And the courts supposedly even censor some businesses. A guy that sells wine, and the price of the wine in his store is 22 reais. 22 is the number of Bolsonaro. So the, so the, the electoral justice is telling him that he's not allowed 
to advertise this price anymore. We also spoke with Joel Pinheiro, an economist and columnist for one of Brazil's largest newspapers. He says the details of the alleged court ruling against Chauvin Pan are still unclear. I still haven't read that decision. I haven't met someone who has read it. He also says that the electoral court has ruled in favor of Bolsonaro in the past, when media outlets accused him of being a cannibal. So they banned it also. You cannot call Bolsonaro a cannibal. Brazilians are set to vote between Bolsonaro and Lula in the presidential runoff elections at the end of this month. Reporting by Arian Pastar, NTD News. And now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Brooklyn Nets all-star Kevin Durant has become the latest sports star to invest in a new Major League Pickleball franchise. The former NBA MVP was announced Thursday as an owner of an expansion team, joining the likes of fellow basketball greats LeBron James and Draymond Green, former tennis number one Kim Clijsters, and seven-time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady. Major League Pickleball was founded in 2021 and is already expanding from 12 to 16 teams for the upcoming season. In rock climbing news, Iranian female climber Elnaz Rakabi will not be sanctioned or suspended after violating her country's stringent dress code. This is according to the president of Iran's National Olympic Committee. Rakabi neglected to wear a headscarf during a competition Sunday in South Korea, although later she said it was unintentional. The 33-year-old placed fourth in the competition and was cheered by demonstrators upon her return to Tehran on Wednesday. Her situation comes amid protests regarding women's rights following the beating and eventual death of a 22-year-old woman by the so-called morality police last month for violating the dress code. And tonight in sports, a rare equinox of sorts as the big four, the NBA, NHL, NFL and MLB are all in action on the same day for just the 27th time in history. First in the NHL, 24 teams play tonight including three of the four remaining squads who've won all their games thus far. Carolina, Dallas and Calgary. In the NBA, a doubleheader tonight highlighted by Battle of Los Angeles with the Lakers facing the Clippers. In baseball, Game 2 of the ALCS starts at 7.30 with the Astros and the Yankees in action. And finally, in the NFL, the Saints visit the Cardinals on Thursday Night Football. That's all for your sports news today. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.